Over 25 years ago, watching television, I saw what was on was the family feud. In that episode, uh, they had the question to the most popular, the answers to the most popular question, name a king. There were six different, question, uh, six different answers, and they went from King George to King James to uh, King David, uh, but Christ was an answer as well, but it finished third. Do you know who number one was? Ah, that's a good answer, but no. Actually, it was Elvis. <laughs> the number one answer. And that's because we as people, especially Americans, we don't like kings. We rebelled against them. Nevertheless, we who are Catholic and Christian acknowledge there's only one true king above all kings, and that is Christ. And he conquered, not by overpowering, but by giving him himself. We hear how, in the first reading from 2 Samuel, David is anointed king. We also hear how, in today's gospel, the legend over Jesus on the cross was the king of the Jews. But in Luke's gospel, he is presented as king of all people and of creation. That's why the repentant thief being crucified alongside Jesus, who is not Jewish, He's crucified, yet he says to Christ, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He turns to Christ. Turning to God is an act of repentance. Repent means to turn. And when we turn to God, we are redeemed by God. He becomes our savior. In fact, within this celebration, we ask God to save us. When you say Hosanna, that means save us. We come and turn to Christ. Yet, with that, we acknowledge that we will serve with Christ. That's why at the opening prayer, it suggested that we would render Christ's majesty service. And that service is not just to God, but to others. The place where Jesus established his kingship, according to Luke, was there at Calvary. Calvary is translated as the place of the skull. Whose skull? Adam's skull. There's somebody in my scripture class. It's Adam's skull, and that represents that all people, beginning from Adam, have been redeemed by Christ. All they have to do is turn to him and ask. Their sins are wiped clean through that same sacrifice. In fact, Underneath that rock of Calvary, there is a chapel, and under that chapel is exposed a painting with a crack in the rock, and you can see the wood of the cross, and underneath that, there's dripping blood through the crack onto the skull of Adam, acknowledging the redemption of all peoples. That's why in Luke's genealogy, he begins, it starts with Christ and goes back to Adam, 
while in Matthew's genealogy, he starts with Abraham. So Jesus, in Luke's gospel, is not just king of the Jews. He's the king of all peoples. Everyone who turns to him, no matter what nation, is promised redemption. You hear how Jesus responds. This day you will be with me in paradise. Jesus is God. He's past, present, and future. So that day, in reality, even though in our minds we're bound by space and time, it's instantaneous that he is in heaven. When we celebrate this Eucharist, and you willingly choose, prior to the Eucharistic prayer, ask for save, salvation by saying Hosanna and acknowledging God in heaven on high, you then participate in a redemptive work of seeking salvation for all peoples, even those we do not like. Even the most notorious person is allowed to be redeemed. And if they don't ask for themselves, we implore God on their behalf. That's why when we come to Mass, we're called to think of people who we wish to be redeemed, even those who are not here. We come in mind with names. To be brought before God for redemption. As the gifts come forward, the work of human hands and human labor, labor in the making of bread and the making of uh, <clears throat> wine, that all the work of humanity and all the acts of service for others and sacrifice of other peoples are brought before the altar of God. And the altar represents the rock of Calvary. And every sacrifice is perfected in the blood of that sacrifice. And it's lifted up to heaven by the priest acting in the person of Christ. And God, in turn, restores that and gives that back to us in the form of the Eucharist that we take in and receive. He empowers us to continue asking for the redemption of all people. To think about those people, people who are truly in need. Just like those on the cross who are reviled, those, the, 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 the other thief on the cross who was not seeking redemption. He wanted to live life here on earth. Those people who are crucifying Jesus. Jesus shed his blood for them. We need to understand how we can be of greater service to God and to others. To acknowledge and choose to kneel before God. Not because we're bad. But because we choose to participate with him in sacrifice. And so too, in so doing, he raises it up. We call each other, <clears throat> as children of God, we call upon him to provide for us. His mercy abounds. We are gifted. And just as he rose from the dead and appeared to his disciples in that upper room, instead of chastising, saying, where were you? Why did you abandon me? Why did you deny me? He simply said, peace be with you. He was offering them newness of life, the resurrection, redemption, and entrance into heaven. When we, in turn, offer each other the sign of peace, we look, and instead of seeing someone who is imperfect, we see the image of our God. One redeemed, one chosen to receive him. And when we celebrate that Eucharist that we participate in, 
we celebrate with all the saints in heaven. We celebrate with the repentant thief. For we are in communion with God at that moment. We receive him into our minds, into our hearts, and then into our homes. There's something far greater going on that needs to be part of our daily life. Allow yourselves to encounter Christ, to receive him, and to rejoice with him. For true joy is being with God. Happiness is something fleeting. Joy is eternal. May God's joy be yours, and may your families share in the banquet of Christ eternally in heaven.